audibletrial.com slash Lores. I want you to sign up for a free audio book. Download it. Cancel immediately. They will either give you another audio book or a discounted trial. If you really love audio books and that's your thing, cool. Go with the discounted trial. Otherwise, just cancel. Keep your audio book. I get a kickback. Jeff Bezos gets nothing, okay? You should scam Amazon as frequently as possible. Report orders missing that you actually receive. AudibleTrial.com slash Lores. These are all jokes, okay? Don't really do that, but actually do that. I do condone it. Today is a bonus episode. I'm going to be getting to the show momentarily, but I wanted to let you know that this is the last week to claim certain items of merch in the Lores.live store. I'm going to be removing certain t-shirts, certain sweaters, okay? We have a new line of clothing coming in for spring not every piece of attire is going to make the jump. So head on over to lowres.live slash store if you sign up for the mailing list. I still have a not quite expired holiday seasonal code that you can use to get 10% off any order in the store. That's lowres.live slash store. This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. I'm your host, Lorez, and this is a bonus episode. Oh, boy. Aren't you in for a treat? Take your last fucking tour, man! Lock the gates on these fuckheads! Where's my goddamn car? William! I'm going to be doing these on Patreon, mostly, in the months to come, but I felt like putting one out today, right ahead of the episode with Casey Estrada and Hans that will be released this afternoon on Isle of Dogs. <clears throat> Because if you were listening to this on iTunes or through the RSS feed in your preferred podcasting app, you're getting these episodes sometime after they've been recorded. And these past two weeks in particular have been somewhat eventful in that I released a short documentary, The Fall of WTF with Mark Marin, And talking about it five weeks or however long from now won't be ideal. So, as of my recording this, the documentary has been watched a little over 72,000 times. It might actually be closer to 74,000 at this point, but you know, these details are uh, kind of irrelevant. You know, it's a bit different from the usual fare that I deal with when it comes to these short documentaries, but the subject matter isn't something that anybody has really talked about. And so, I put this out and wound up turning over a rock that exposed a bunch of agitated geriatrics. And look, maybe this is a delusion of grandeur. I did make a documentary about how his program has taken a gigantic dive, but I don't think that I was outright disrespectful to Mark Marin or his show. And as a matter of fact, honestly, he should come to my home personally and thank me for making this documentary because I'm the only one who publicly, as of late anyway, that has acknowledged the fact that for a period of time, he was the best at what he was doing. Nobody was tuning into those other podcasts of that era like they were tuning into WTF with Mark Marin. That was the premier comedy podcast of 2009, 10, 11, probably 12 as well. That might be pushing it, though. But many of the people that tuned into my documentary acted as if I had uh, waged an all-out assault on him, when in actuality, obviously the gist of the documentary was, for many people, this podcast is a bore now, and here's why that is. But I'm not going to harp on that, because I don't think those people, for the most part, are listening to this podcast, and their minds probably can't be changed. You know, moreover, it's not worth my time to attempt to change their minds, because that's not my demographic. I can look at YouTube analytics and see that 99.9% .9 of the people that are tuning into whatever I'm making are usually men in their 20s. These guys that look like Ben and Jerry, they wouldn't even know what to do with my Japan series, so it's a lost cause. I mean, ultimately, I view Mark Marin as a tragic figure, and truly, I do, really. You know, there are guys out there who take pleasure in seeing these these, these people's careers disintegrate over a period of time. Me? You know, I only want to see Kamel Nanjiani get accused of a savage raping. But other than that, no, 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 no. I would never find joy in a man's downfall. You know, I, but I watch these wonderfully made documentaries by guys like Porcelain that are out there covering 
the fractured careers of comedians like Owen Benjamin or Jim Norton. And I sob uncontrollably. I can't stop myself. The whole duration, it's just tears, waterworks. It's like I'm watching Barry Lyndon. But I, I don't judge those who do. I, you know, it's a, it's a spectacle to see that these people who were once on top or have uh, any kind of status, earned or not, falling apart at the seams. And I think it's fair to say that one of these individuals who might is a Mr. Mike David of Red Bar Radio. That's actually his nickname on the show is Mr. Mike. The demise of What the Fuck with Mark Marin. This was a video that I found by this great guy. Look at this guy. Low Res Wonderbread is his name. I'm going to give him a plug here today. He doesn't have enough subscribers. 5.1K. Low Res, Low Res Wonderbread. You got to like... You gotta see this guy. He did a uh, documentary, The Demise of What the Fuck with Mark Marin, and I suggest you watch it. I gave this a watch last night, and it is like, yeah, he did have a demise, didn't he? Because that show used to be like a show that everybody listened to, and then it kind of just still there. It's still exactly the same, but why does nobody really talk about it? Why does nobody care about it? Why do we hate Marin so much? He lays it all out. We got some good coverage on his show, and he recommended my YouTube channel to his viewers, which was great. It was very cool. You know, typically you don't want to wind up on Red Bar. You know, you wind up on Red Bar, that means you've committed some kind of social felony that needs to be addressed. You know, some of the worst humans in the industry are documented on this show. And I don't mean like Harvey Weinstein, but like Tom Segura. You know, it, it's, a, it's a quality show. I would actually say it's a great survival guide for existing on the internet. So check it out on redbarradio.net. I believe that is the only place to get it because I think he was banned from iTunes. So, uh, But this Marin documentary, let me tell you, I didn't realize that Mark Marin had a mobilized unit of angry flip-flop wearing guitar playing baby boomers that would come out the woodwork and attempt to gut me over this thing. You know, where, where are these people congregating? Because I'll tell you what, I, I, I do thorough research before I dive into any topic for the non-fiction medium. And you can take a look at Marin's social media pages, his Facebook, Twitter, Reddit. Compared to other comedians, those are a ghost town, okay? I saw he posted a photo with Brad Garrett of Everybody Loves Raymond, and that got a very reasonable amount of likes, especially considering that it's Brad Garrett. So hundreds, but by comparison, there were virtually no comments whatsoever. I want to say like maybe 20 to 25. And every Reddit post is just a link to a brand new episode. Nobody's really conversing about the names of his cats or, oh, did you hear that he sold his new home and he's moving out to where, it, you know, it, nobody gives a shit about that. There aren't 12 to 22-year-old cretins of an ambiguous gender drawing photos of Mark Marin on Twitter. Uh, there's no fan fiction. Nobody has that kind of investment built into this program. I think the only time that people are really listening to it nowadays is if they have some kind of incentive where maybe the guest is somebody that they really love and adore. Maybe they're a big John Cleese fan, and they'll listen to that. And it's like, oh yeah, Mark Maron exists. It's just, it's a part of their lives they don't even remember anymore, you know? And I, I think Serial is probably the same way. Serial, the mystery podcast that created this boom of true crime for the podcasting genre. But nowadays, people are listening to Last Podcast on the Left, Although they might be on their way out soon as well. Uh, My Favorite Murder, uh, Sword and Scale. These types of programs essentially took the place of Serial because that hag didn't know what the fuck to do with her own property. And so now, I mean, Serial Season 3 premiered early... Uh, oh, no, 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 sorry. It, it premiered late last year. And there was no buzz about that. Because it's the same deal as Mark Marin. They didn't know how to handle their property and they let that flame die down. That's all I'm getting at, is you know, nobody really cares about Mark Marin. He should just go die in a ditch. You know, I'm kidding. I, I kid, I make jokes on this show. But anyway, I, I wanna get back to the comments that were left on this video that I made and released through my YouTube channel, Low Res Wonder Bread. Go subscribe if you have not already. Uh, you know, I knew that some would agree with my assessment and many others wouldn't. But I did find the complaints interesting. And one of the more frequent was that the video was considered clickbait. 
Now, it's called The Fall of WTF with Mark Marin. The YouTube title swaps fall for demise just for the sake of theatrics, but there's nothing insincere about that title. If you take a look at the visible analytics of the show, and granted, iTunes does not really offer a whole lot, so all you have to go off of is a list of the most downloaded episodes for a week, the most downloaded podcasts, and you can break that up by genre and view also the overall uh, amount of podcasts that are released and distributed through that platform. You know, I don't want to hit the same beats of the documentary in doing this, but it's an undeniable fact. He had the number one podcast for a period of time. You take a look at the list now, and he's in the 140s. He's in the 150s. Uh, maybe on a good day, he might make the top 50. But I think that just goes to show that the general taste has changed. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But if you don't do anything about it, then you're just going to fade. And that's a normal part of this whole system. The show has had a massive decline. There's no question to this. It's a fact. He might be making the same amount of money off of sponsors and getting better guests than he did in 2010. But again, who is listening? And that was the purpose of the documentary. Mark Marin has suffered a fate that is maybe arguably worse than somebody like an Anthony Cumia who has become a frightening parody of himself. Because the sick thing that I really believe about these types of guys that are frequently discussed and criticized is they have that annoyance in their lives and they can invert it in their heads into a belief that they are relevant somehow. So even though they might hate it, I think it helps them sleep easier at night knowing that they are part of the conversation. But to just be disregarded after reaching the top, literally the highest point, in my opinion, is the worst fate that somebody like this can suffer. You had a number one podcast. You interviewed the president. He came to your home. <laughs> and you were forgotten. I think it also goes to show just how disposable of a medium this is. But that's probably a different conversation for another time. But again, I I'm going to try to avoid retreading the points of the documentary too much or complaining about the comments because in all honesty, they didn't bother me. Uh, but I do feel the need to use them as a launch point to talk about other things that are pivotal to understanding where we are as a culture and our entertainment consumption, which was the core of that video. Because to circle back to these comedians who just shrug off the criticism, the complaints about stagnation in their shows, or the folks who highlight their undesirable traits on video, I couldn't think of a worse decision than to do that. Now, obviously, if you're Anthony Cumia, you're never going to want to bring up the fact that there's a nine-part series that details you and your brother's behavioral tendencies, so it's probably easier to compartmentalize that and disregard it as a fringe part of your fan base. But take a look at the view counter on the latest installment of Beige Frequency series on Kumia, and then keep in mind that for Compound Media, the podcast network that Kumia owns, their Facebook page has just about the same number of likes as the amount of views on that video, 44,000. To add to that, their Facebook posts on average get between 5 to 25 likes and no comments, which I'm not bragging here. I do much better than that, typically, on my Facebook page, Low Res Wonderbread. People don't really think about these things, or, you know, uh, probably the average person that is listening to me talk about their average amount of likes on a Facebook post isn't thinking about these things as consequential or as something that matters. And I couldn't disagree with that more. I think it matters a whole lot, more than people want to uh, discuss. Because when we talk about those stats regarding the Compound Media Facebook page as opposed to the 44,000 views, and that's not to account for the thumbs up, thumbs down ratio. There's probably dozens, if not hundreds of comments. The equivalent to that is essentially the effect of having your entire base watch that documentary. It's the same amount of numbers. But in reality, I'd venture to guess that no show on that network, Compound Media, gets more than 8,000 downloads on average per episode. 
Now, obviously, these documentaries that come out are an extreme worst case scenario for somebody like Kumia or Owen Benjamin. I don't necessarily put my documentary in the same bin as what Beige Frequency and Porcelain have done. I do think that the work that they've put out has been very funny and it is intended to entertain that community that's online that has built itself off of the Opie and Anthony show. And while I don't necessarily view my documentary as falling within that category, if you do, then so be it. You can take it however you want. I think that's fair. As I said before, these documentaries are an extreme worst case scenario, but they are a direct product of the current entertainment climate. In the past, these types of guys who work in comedy and entertainment, they probably would have graduated to doing sitcoms or movies, and maybe they still will. Who knows? You know, the future is very open, but... Personally, I think that is now reserved for maybe Ali Wong types, you know. But at the moment, online programming is the most consistently rewarding and lucrative business that there is because of the general hunger for it. Obviously, they all know this because if they didn't, there wouldn't be thousands of podcasts out there or live shows that are hosted on YouTube and uh, similar platforms. Now, here's the effect that instead of escalating into Hollywood and high-budget scripted projects, they remain on that direct line where they're accessible to their fans and their audience. But many of them still retreat to this compartmentalization mindset that they would have gotten away with in that traditional era where they're working in the business, behind the scenes, there's cameras, there's a studio, set. Uh, but they do this and they can't get away with it now because everything is so immediate. And the result of this is a visible decay for everybody to see. So if you're one of these people, you've got two options. You can either block out that criticism and dismiss it all as trolling, or you can handle it. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, many of these people choose to handle it by reacting poorly and lashing out against those who are delivering the criticism. And you see this with tons of people. Now, clearly not every piece of criticism is worth listening to. Sometimes people just want to rile you up, but you should pay attention to it nonetheless. When it comes to lashing out, this is obviously a terrible method of dealing with this particular issue. And if you look close enough, you can see some of the new comedians and entertainers that have come up over the past five to 10 years from YouTube and other spaces who are currently untouchable committing some of these deeds. Now, when it comes to Mark Maron, the thing is, I don't think he even got an ounce of the flack that these people get today. His audience changed over time. So even when he covered for Amy Schumer stealing jokes, the amount of criticism he, re he received excuse me, for that was a lot smaller than someone with, say, Louis J. Gomez's audience. I don't know why I'm acting like Louis J. Gomez is the new podcasting king, but just just go with it for now, okay? So, like an unbaptized baby, Mark Marin has wound up in limbo. If he can escape, I will be both surprised and impressed, but my prediction is that he'll keep doing the show the way he's been doing it until he's dead or all of his sponsors pull out, because that just seems to be the mindset that is present in his uh, dome. All right, that's about it for today. I hope you enjoy the full 90-some-odd-minute episode I've got going up later today with Casey Estrada and Hans. We had a great time talking about Wes Anderson. I think we talked about Nanette. And uh, yeah, I'll see you for the next one.